So it's been a little bit since I've done one of these um, lives and I think I'm a little overdue. So here I am doing confessions of a house cleaner, but I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. I wanted to talk about this show. It's on the Discovery Channel. And this is not sponsored. Um, this is just my thoughts on this TV show, Undercover Billionaire. So before I start, a um, couple things I want to say. First of all, I'm not a billionaire. I'm not even a financial expert or anything like that. I have my own business, not even close to a, a, a billion dollar business, not even a million dollar business. Um, but yeah, I am a business person. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say about me and my perspective on this. And the other thing I wanted to say is I actually went to school with Glenn Stearns. He's the billionaire in this show. And um, I can tell you that the things that he says about where he comes from are true. He was a father at 14 years old. And um, I actually knew the mother better than I knew him. She was in one of my classes. And so she was 16. He was 14, which is extremely young for somebody to be a father. But um, I can remember her being frustrated because she had all the responsibility of uh, taking care of this child and she was obviously very young as well um, and you know he was a 14 year old kid and by his own professions you know he wasn't doing well in school and um, you know apparently there were some other issues in his home life um, that he talks about now I wasn't aware of at the time but um, you know his parents had addiction problems and, um, he did grow up in a blue-collar community um, literally on the other side of the track so I grew up in Rockville Maryland same place he obviously did and the B&O Railroad goes along that part of it's called uh, Rockville Pike it turns into Wisconsin Avenue as you get into DC but um, there's a, a railroad that runs along there so I lived on this side and I was a few blocks away it was a few blocks where my neighborhood started. We were like middle, middle class, and I could hear the trains at night. You couldn't hear them during the day. But he, his neighborhood was literally right backed up against those train tracks. So there were people on the main drag in his neighborhood whose backyards were right up against the railroad. So he, he did literally grow up on the other side of the tracks. Um, so, you know, the things that he says about himself is true um, in his past. So I can vouch for that. So anyway, um, I, there's been two episodes so far, and um, the first episode, basically what they did was they put him in Erie. He, he didn't know where he was going until he got there. He's in Erie, Pennsylvania, and he had $100 and uh, a, an old pickup truck and um, no contacts in his phone. And he was supposed to, he's supposed to be building a billion dollar business in Erie, Pennsylvania, and he has 90 days to do it. So that's that's the basis of the story of this series that's on the Discovery Channel. So in the first episode, he gets there and um, some, you know he's trying to decide. Which I think this part of it was smart. He decided that he needed three thousand dollars to survive that ninety days in uh, Erie, so that he would have shelter and food and you know the basic things that you need. So um, he figured that in the in a week he was supposed to come up with three thousand dollars so he starts out and um, he's he's looking for odd jobs the things that people posted on Craigslist um, and he starts scrapping he's looking for um, wrought iron and um, he's looking for great big industrial um, tires that he can flip to make some money and he's sleeping in his truck. So he goes in the store and I, maybe he doesn't shop, I don't know, or maybe um, the store that he chose was like a little convenience store, but he thought he mentions that the prices were higher than he thought and he's looking at things like um, cup of noodles and that kind of stuff. Um, so he gets those and he does ask for, um, you know, some hot water because he doesn't have a microwave even. Um, and, you know, so he's living off of the ramen noodle thing and going to, um, these abandoned uh, like manufacturing places um, in looking for the things you know the scraps and he also um, I, I got the impression now this is one of the things where I'm kind of wondering you know hmm 
um, I got the impression that he posted something on Craigslist that he's available to do odd jobs, basically. Um, I don't know where he posted it on Craigslist. I mean, I looked and they did show on his phone he was going through Craigslist. So, but I know, he didn't have a cost. Now, I know that when I post my ads on Craigslist, I have to pay. Um, Craigslist is not uh, totally free any longer, but um, I think there's some ways around it if you post not on a regular basis maybe but under like community or under gigs and things like that but if you're posting actual you know labor and you post it under um, the for sale section and the parts where I would have to post um, to stay legitimate and not get blackballed by Craigslist I have to pay for those ads it's still very inexpensive but anyway so he he's done that and he's also um, I think applied to some odd jobs different things on um, Craigslist, um, you know, to try to get some money. Um, so he's done that, and they show him going around looking for things, and he's having a hard time finding um, some things that he's looking for. Um, so he gets a couple calls. He gets a call from this one company that manufactures balls for dogs, and um, interestingly, before he uh, took this position, um, which was commission-based, okay, um, he had, he's given out business tips. So one of the things he was saying was, um, find your customer first and then decide. So basically the business concept is you want to fill a need. So you got to find out what the need is. And, and then um, he went to sell these dog balls and failed miserably. Um, and then he, you know, he says he broke his own rules, finding the customer, or finding what the customer first and then finding out what they need, right? Um, so in the meantime, he, um, cleaned the house, go Glenn, um, well, yeah, so he was cleaning toilets and, um, you know, mopping floors and things like that, there's a bug. Um, and then he also got a job with, um, a company that uh, they do t-shirts they make t-shirts so he got a job there and he worked for six hours and he made sixty dollars which okay so that's ten dollars an hour to me um, the thing that I found kind of poignant about this is the man does have a million dollars so working for ten dollars an hour there's almost a beauty in that because he's been stripped down to basically just his, his clothes and a car and he doesn't even have the whole hundred dollars anymore because he spent a little bit of it. So all of a sudden sixty dollars um, it's not that much. I mean, you know, it's a lot of money for somebody who has nothing. Ten dollars an hour all of a sudden seems like pretty good money when you have nothing um, or you're just starting out. But the thing about that was, and actually all three of them, the, the guy that he um, was, well, two of them anyway, the guy that he was doing, uh, selling the balls for, but in particular, the guy with the t-shirt company, um, he took the time to talk to them, and find out a little bit about their business and get to know them. And this is very strategic. And I found that this actually works with my business too. Um, getting to know your customer, well in his case this was an employer, but talking to people and getting to know them and finding out why they do things a certain way or what is their business or what is their passion in life and just really developing relationships, okay? And this has actually come out to be a key point because later on, when he's down to like $40, um, he's driving around, he's still having trouble finding the things that he's looking for that he wants to scrap or flip and um, it's close to St. Patrick's Day and he sees all this stuff about a big St. Patrick's Day parade and a little idea clicks in his head and he's like, there's gonna be people around so why don't we go ahead and try to make some money on this event even though it's a one-time thing. So he goes and he calls the t-shirt guy and says, hey, I got this idea. Um, you wanna help me sell some swag is what he's calling it for this parade. So the t-shirt guy says yes, and he goes and he spends all that he's got left, he's down to like four bucks, he spent all this money um, on um, just trinkets and things that he can resell, and he sold them for five dollars. So he spent a dollar and he, he increased his profit margin by, you know, 
that much by selling these things for five dollars in the thick of this parade um, so that was pretty smart using an opportunity it might have been a once in a lifetime or once in a while type of an opportunity but he took advantage of it um, so I thought that was pretty smart on one hand but I don't know in all honesty I don't know if I would be brave enough to spend almost everything I have on something you know that I wasn't so sure about because I've never worked a parade I mean maybe it would work out I don't know I thought that was a big leap of faith and he ended up making four hundred dollars but it also brings to mind some other things to me like you know I, and I don't know I guess that varies from place to place but when you're a vendor at an event do you have to have a license you know do you have to have a certain permit to work these events they didn't mention anything about that and then later on as the St. Patrick's Day festivities were going on they went into a bar and they sold out everything so that was kind of cool and it was a great um, source to go to um, you know to try to turn over real quick but, um, you know, how did they manage that without getting into trouble, too? Because I don't, you know, a business establishment may or may not allow you to come in. You know, you would have to talk to the manager. And then again, you know, what are the regulations on that? I don't, I don't really know. So that raises a little question in my head. But, you know, it's a show. It's a TV show. Um, so that at the end of the day or at the end of episode one, he went, you know, from $100 down to like less than $5 back up to $400. So in episode two, which starts out like nine days later, so I don't know what happened between the fourth day and the ninth day. It was like five days lost, which didn't, I guess nothing really eventful happened. He, um, you know, and he, they didn't, I don't think they were very clear on how much money he had left at the end of those, you know, at the ninth day. They did say that um, he'd been sleeping in his truck and um, he was getting sick. So he had, he still had a, somewhere around the $400, but he had to go to the emergency room and that cost him, or, or an urgent care, someplace like that, and that cost him $250. Now, when you think about this as somebody who's living on the streets or living day to day, who can't afford health insurance because he didn't have, he couldn't use health insurance, but you know, that $250 is more than half of what he had. So if it was somebody like me and I was just throwing up, I might think twice before going to the doctor or somebody who's living just on the edge you know they may think twice about going to the doctor too you know because $250 can make or break you for the week um, but he went to the and he got fine he was good um, and then he um, he got a car he he wait a minute oh he found some tires that's right he finally found the tires that he was looking for and so he was able to sell them at a really huge markup. Um, so he got uh, about a thousand dollars out of that. And from that thousand dollars, then he started looking around for places where he could buy a car cheap. And he um, got turned down a couple places. One of the places he went to, um, they were uh, going through bankruptcy, so they couldn't sell to him. And I, you know, that's that's a problem. But that, you know, so he he got turned down a couple times, but he finally found a lot that was closing down their business and um, he bought a car he negotiated with them got it down um, and he managed eventually to get um, I forgot how much he got for that but he did make a fairly good profit on what he spent on the car now somehow he got lucky because this would never work for me I can tell you that right now because um, I got one over here where I spent more than he spent and I'm still working on this car because it's got problems but anyway um, the car was basically running well he all he did was give it a bath vacuum it out you know clean it up make it pretty and he was able to sell that car fairly quickly for a reasonable price um, he did uh, he had a price in mind I guess his high price and the he did this twice he sold two cars and he did the negotiation thing and I think that you know sometimes as um, people when we're transact doing transactions either trying to purchase something or when we're selling we're afraid to negotiate and um, sometimes that can be the difference between making a sale if you're the business person or actually getting um, a good deal if you're somebody who's trying to, to buy something so um, yeah he did do some negotiating and um, he ended up with enough money to 
put a deposit down on an apartment. It was a, um, a very small apartment, and I think it was around $400 or 430 something, I don't know, for this apartment. So um, he got his apartment, and then the next thing he did, and this was a great idea, and I can't remember what they called it. This is still in episode two, um, but it's basically like the Small Business Association. Um, they have them everywhere. That's everywhere, and there's a lot of resources with the Small Business Association, so they'll do market studies for you. A lot of times they'll give you um, resources so, so that you can conduct meetings if you don't have an office or a place to do your meetings. Um, and they'll let you use your computers they they give you some training and some classes and i did look up um locally what we have here in my area and um i saw some pretty interesting things so that would be something that you might want to look into if you're considering growing a business but anyway his idea was to start a brewery or like a, a some kind of designer brewery i'm not a drinker so my terminology is not that great but basically he wanted to start um like a, a, a brewery type of a bar place and um, he found a lawyer and he was talking to the lawyer and this tells me that he really didn't think this through when he came up this with this idea um, one of the factors that he found out was that um, you know with this type of a business with alcohol and alcohol business alcohol poly beverages it's very regulated and there's a lot of different agencies government agencies that you have to apply to and get approval with and um, because of you know some of the things the dangers that come with alcohol consumption and selling alcohol and the responsibilities etc um, plus it's a consumable product that people are taking into their bodies you know all these different aspects of it um, besides the actual brewing and making of beer um, that the time frame from you know starting the process to getting the licensing and whatever other regulations he has to meet up with was well beyond his 90 day time frame so that wasn't going to work out for the purposes of what he's trying to do here so I don't think he really thought that through but you know for somebody who's trying to think of what can I do to start a business I think this is good insight or a good example of something that you can look at to say well if I want to start a business and I need to do X Y and Z within this amount of time for whatever your personal needs are you know it, t it pays to do your research and find out how involved is it to do certain types of businesses because obviously some have a lot of regulations on them and some have very little regulations um, so he yeah that was about the end of where they um, left off at the end of season, uh, episode two so where I'm at right now uh, you know Discovery Channel knew all about this Glenn might not have known everything but the Discovery Channel had to do a lot of planning before they put all this into place so some things come to mind like with him sleeping on the side of the road or him going into what is still somebody's property to look for um, salvageable things that he can resell um, you know did the Discovery Channel have to go to Erie and say look we're planning to do this we're bringing this famous um, billionaire in are you going to harass him if he's sleeping in his truck on the side of the road you know how do you treat your homeless people because that's basically what he was he started out as a homeless person um, you know what are your what about him going and poking through trash bins and all that and I'm not a hundred percent sure that everything was completely abandoned because there was also other vehicles around some of them look like work trucks you know there was just there's certain things about that that make me question like mm, you know how did he do that not that I'm not poo-pooing what he's done but there are certain things that I I think were left out behind the scenes that maybe have been orchestrated by the Discovery Channel um, or maybe not I don't know I mean a lot of this is what he's coming up with on his own but they had to know that he was going to be homeless to start with and they you know they had to have some kind of idea how he planned to go about it when they were talking about doing this series to start with so I'm sure he must have come with them and said look this is what I want to do bum, 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 bum. and this is how I'm gonna do it and I think it'll work you know and my other thought is that by the end of the series um, I'm pretty sure whatever business he comes up with which I actually know but I don't want to ruin it if you haven't done your research um, but I'm pretty sure I don't know this fact about it I know what business it is 
um, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna come out to be a million dollar business because if it isn't first of all he's got to give a million dollars to this business um, but secondly I just don't know that it would be a great series if it if it failed you know or if it didn't meet the expectation so um, you know it, it had to work out but anyway um those are my basic thoughts on this uh, I'm interested to see how you know he's gonna go on to the next thing I think he's very brave and um, risk-taking with his money because he'll throw almost everything he has into a project and thankfully it comes back to him oh the other thing he did in episode two is he got together a team of people to talk about this brewery you know which he's gonna have to tell them I guess in episode three that it, it's not gonna work out it's not gonna work um, and we're gonna change directions but he did get a group of people so he has a marketing person he has a web designer he has a carpenter you know which is gonna come in handy and I'll explain that to you in a second but um he did get himself a group of strong people to, to support the team who are interested and one of those people is the t-shirt guy okay who's going to be a significant person through the course of this whole um, series but um, anyway he does have a group of people behind him um, and I know that he's been talking about flipping houses and and based on the previews and things that they're showing to keep you interested in the show he does buy a house somewhere along the line how he gets the capital for that I don't know um, that's another thing so he goes into this town and his name is not Glenn Stearns he's going as Glenn Bryant he's telling people you know to explain the cameras that he's doing a documentary on starting over at 55 my age okay so now y'all know um, so that explains the cameras right but that's not his name so this is raising a question in my head he's looking for the money for a down payment on a house okay not to pay the whole house but a down payment so that's not his real name so that tells me that he's somehow gonna have to coordinate financing so I'm gonna be interested in that because Glenn Bryant who's not a real person doesn't have a social security number and has absolutely no credit how is he gonna finance this that's the question that I'm looking for so it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, on episode 3 because I think he gets the house in the next episode and where he comes up you know with his next idea because he doesn't have a lot of time to fool around so we'll see um, thank you for watching I'd love to hear your comments let me know if you're watching this series and what you think about it and I'll talk to you later thank you bye bye